Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. Because this is such a long story, we're going to use the story arc for today. And I won't read the text at the beginning. We'll just read it as we go. Let's get started. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. These are our opening details, and um, they add... Um, well, they add complexity to the story right from the very beginning. Sorry, I'm going to get a thicker pen here. Hopefully you guys can read this better. There we go. Uh, these are the opening details. And they provide some, some excellent points just right off the beginning. Let's take each one uh, a verse at a time. Um, in the time of King Herod of Judea, so that gives us the time frame, there is a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. So that just gives you the uh, the division that he comes from. And his wife, Elizabeth, also a descendant of Aaron. Um, the reason the word also is here is because all priests are descendants of Aaron. At the time in Israel's history, there was probably around 18,000 priests. So Zechariah is one of 18,000 people uh, who is a priest in the nation, uh, descendants of Aaron. And the wife, Elizabeth, is also part of the same tribe. Um, so that's the first part of the story. So if we start this off in verse 5, it opens with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we're looking at priests, or priest, and um, we'll just put Aaronites. They're from the house of Aaron, right? Okay, now the next thing in the story, verse 6, is that they are blameless. So let's go back to the story. Both of them, uh, here we go, we'll divide that up. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Um, and if we were to wonder, you know, what does it look to be righteous in the sight of God? Oops, let me, again, use a thicker pen here. Righteous in the sight of God. If we were to ask, what does it look like to be righteous? Uh, that is immediately explained in the next line, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. And of course, um, this is not the kind of blamelessness of Christ, meaning just utterly perfect and without sin. But it does mean that Zechariah and Elizabeth, the both of them, are righteous. When God sees them, they are they're righteous. They do what's right. You know, kind of like, like Noah uh, is described this way in the Old Testament. They observe the lands, the Lord's commands and decrees. So that's the second thing that we would see in this verse six. They are blameless. And then verse seven, and this is the way the plot begins to thicken, is that Elizabeth is barren. And we have to remember, kind of culturally, that that's pretty significant because um, it's just kind of assumed that there's got to be something wrong with you to be barren. They were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. She was barren and they were both very old. So not only is Elizabeth barren once, Elizabeth is a twice barren woman. She was not only not able to conceive, she was also old past childbearing years. We should be thinking, by the way, of Sarah. So let me go. Oh, that's not the right one. Here we go. We should be thinking of Sarah. Elizabeth is doubly barren. And I'm going to put a little red line here. Um, and I'm going to write the name Sarah. We should be thinking of the story of Sarah, who was also doubly barren, right? When she had her son, Isaac. All right, back to the story. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty... And he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood 
to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Okay, so once, so we have this, it's like this one time this is happening. You have Zechariah's division, which would have come from his uh, village. They're all going to the temple. Remember, you have, you have 18,000 priests in the land. They don't all live in the city of Jerusalem. They're scattered about the country. And they go to the city of Jerusalem to work in and be in service priests in the temple. So Zechariah's division is on duty. And not only that, he was serving as priest before God. And for us, we should just kind of begin to wonder, you know, what does that look like? What does it mean to be the priest? I mean, obviously he's a priest, but today he gets to be the priest before God. And, and let's try to kind of understand this context a little bit. He was chosen by lot. So, so being a priest before God is not something you get to volunteer for. It is something you have to win the lottery, if you will, to do. And lot, again, is their dice. And this is not by chance. This is according to the custom of the priesthood. <clears throat> so his division is on duty. That's the first kind of layer, if you will, of um, what's special about this. Um, and now he is serving before the Lord. So specifically, he's on duty uh, according to the choosing of lots, the custom of the priesthood. And his job on this day is to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of burning incense came, all, were, uh, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. This, by the way, burning of incense is not... Uh, the Day of Atonement sacrifice, this burning of incense was part of the morning and evening uh, daily ritual. It was a continual sacrifice before the Lord of burning incense. But why is this significant? We'll back up to this number up here, 18,000. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Sorry. I apologize. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, morning and evening, there are these, <laughs> there are these uh, sacrifices of incense before the Lord. You have 18,000 priests, which means not everybody gets to do it. In fact, uh, the rule was another custom of the priesthood uh, we know from history is that you only got to do this once in your life. And one could go their whole life and never get to do this job of doing the morning and evening incense burning. So Zechariah has been a priest his whole life. He's done many, divi he's, his division's gone here many times. He's served many times, but this is the only time in his whole life that he's ever gotten to do this particular thing, chosen by Lot, present these sacrifices before the Lord. And so if we're looking at verses eight through nine, <clears throat> uh, just kind of continuing, what, let this be built up, verses eight through nine. Um, this is the best day <laughs> of Zechariah's uh, priestly ministry. This is a very big deal. Verse 10, the worshipers are outside mm, praying. So he is the only one in, not the holy of holies, but just simply the holy place. Um, we kind of see that real clearly in the next verses, which um, he's standing on the right side of the altar of incense. That was not in the holy of holies. That was just in the holy place. So verse 10, uh, the time of incense came. All the assembled worshipers are praying outside. At that moment, uh, now it starts to get really crazy. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And so if your Zechariah, the craziest and best day of your life, just got a much crazier, verse 11, an angel appears. Whoops. An angel appears. And... Uh, we got to remember that uh, angels show up in different forms, in different uh, places in the Bible. Outside of the Garden of Eden, it was a cherubim, four wings, uh, an, an incredible, an incredible sight. Not not human-like in its appearance. Um, then you have the seraphim who are on the holy of holies, and then sometimes angels do appear as a man. But even if you were just in a room and you thought you were alone, that would be terrifying in and of itself. 
Uh, so let's go back. He's obviously startled, completely gripped with fear, uh, which makes absolute sense. That's a very reasonable response to an angel of the Lord just appearing next to you. So if we're going back one more time. Oh, I keep doing that. I'm sorry. Um, the last little piece here, verse 12, is Zechariah. Zechariah's terror. <laughs> um, and in that way, he, he almost kind of harkens back, if you will. If there are a thread here, you could think of maybe Isaiah, Isaiah 6. All right, let's come back and let's reach the high point now of the story. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. Let's just go back real quick. Oh, I did it again. Okay. Uh, I'll add one more dot here. Verse 13. You're getting a son. This is good news, right? And now we've got a lot of that thread. Again, back to now let's go to Abraham because uh, this, this promise of a son is coming to a man with a doubly barren wife. Okay. Um, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John, which means the Lord is gracious. I want to make one other point here. Zechariah's prayer has been heard. So the prayer for a son has gone up to the Lord, and Zechariah uh, has prayed this prayer maybe once, maybe thousands of times. Uh, I'm sure at some point he gave up, and yet uh, the Lord has heard, and he has answered this. And he sweetens the deal. Not only will you have a son named John, he will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. Why will many rejoice because of John the Baptist's, <laughs> he has not that called yet, he's just called John, John's birth for, here's the reason, he will be great in the sight of the Lord, right? Because he's great in God's sight, he will be rejoiced among the many. Uh, here's an instruction. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Super important. We're going to see that show up when Mary and Elizabeth meet. The boy doesn't speak Hebrew. He doesn't speak anything, but he's got the Holy Spirit. He will, this is what he's going to do, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents back to their children. And, oh, sorry, I'm going to do this. Two, this is, there's a reason for all this. Two, uh, turn the hearts of their children back to and uh, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Ultimately, right here, we've got some important purpose statements to make a people ready for the Lord, to turn uh, kids back to their parents, to make the diso uh, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Um, he's going to go on before the Lord. He's going to bring back many of the people of the Lord uh, to their God. So if we're understanding all of this prophecy, I'm going to just put this all in one point, 13 through 17, verses... Uh, 13, uh, we'll go with 14 through 17. Um, the promised herald of the Messiah is your son. This is a big deal right here. And if there's a thread here, and there is a thread, it goes back to Malachi, and actually the last verses of the Old Testament, which talk about the birth of this one. Uh, who would be John? So, that is the high point of the first arc of this story. Uh, just an incredible promise. God is faithful. He is, he is making good on his promises. Zechariah begins the next part of this arc. He asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Um, if there were another kind of thread, I'm going to just go with, well, let's go back to the this chart instead. So if we're looking at verse 18, and I think I'm just going to sco scoot all the way down to here. Verse 18, we'll make verse 18 the beginning of the next arc. 
And it begins with Abraham's doubt and his question. And uh, again, we're seeing parallels to Abraham. Uh, once again, we'd be thinking of Abraham here. And particularly, we'd be thinking of Genesis chapter 15, where Abraham doubts and God says, go outside, look up at the stars. Abraham looks up at the stars. He believes God. God credits it to him as righteousness. God says, I'm going to give you the land. Abraham says, how do I know that I'm going to have the land? And God cuts a covenant with Abraham. So on those days, Abraham had great doubt and God strengthened him. Um, or not Abraham's doubt. Whoops. Zechariah's doubt. Sorry. Verse 18 is about Zechariah's doubt. But it mirrors Abraham's doubt in Genesis 15. Except for, we'll notice here that it begins to diverge. So here's the next thing that happened. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. So uh, right, right there, the first correction is, verse 19, uh, the messenger is sufficient proof. Okay. All uh, right. I stand in the presence of God. I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Speaking is going to show up here in another second with uh, this, this kind of judgment or discipline that's put on him. And now you will be silent and will not be able to speak until this day happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Words, once again, show up there. So we have this kind of the angel spoke and because um, Zechariah did not believe, he now loses the ability to speak because, again, he did not believe the words. So that's verse 20. Let's go back over here. Verse 20. The sign of the promise is Abraham, oh, sorry, Zechariah loses speech. So uh, really interesting because, again, we're thinking about the thread here and the thread back to Abraham in Genesis 15, where God was so nice to, to um, Abraham, but <laughs> it, he seems to be a little bit harder on Zechariah. And, of course, we should ask ourselves, why? You know, why would God do this? Why would God be so gentle and patient with Abraham but um, take away Zechariah's speech? I think we just need to remember that Zechariah is an old, devout, learned priest. And God expects, I think, frankly, more of Zechariah. And he is still strengthening Zechariah's faith. He's going to get a sign. The sign and the discipline, though, go hand in hand. So in, in this case, the sign equals the discipline, right? Which for us, just remember Hebrews 12, which would exhort us to see, remember that whenever we're receiving the Lord's discipline, this is actually a sign that we are his children. Which is important. So discipline has a faith constructing purpose. Often we avoid discipline because it's painful, but we miss out on what God actually intends through, which is to build our strength. Or, sorry, build our faith. So while he's having this conversation with the angel, let's look at the next verses. The people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. So let's go back. Verse 21. The people wait. And then verse 22. The angels, whoops. The angel's sign comes true. What happens? Verse 22, when he came out, he could not speak to them, right? This is a fulfillment of what was said up here. This, the, the promise was fulfilled. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple for... He kept 
making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And I just, I just love how this kind of the word signs finally does show up. He's making hand gestures. He's making signs, uh, but he is, he's lost the ability to speak. So now he's trying to communicate signs without, without words. He becomes then kind of the, the walking fulfillment, uh, walking, uh, fulfillment, fulfillment of the angel's promise. Which means that this next thing that the angel promised, which is the first thing, that Elizabeth is going to bear you a son, the proof of that is Zechariah's silence. And now we get to the last verse. When the time of his service was completed, he returned home and had a very awkward conversation with his wife, with his hands, about everything that was going on. But I think Elizabeth and John or and Zechariah, in their old age, try for a son one last time after this his wife became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion the lord has done this for me she said in these days he has shown favor and taken away my disgrace among the people so if we're going back uh, verse 23 uh, zechariah goes home and verse 24 Elizabeth conceives a child. And that is nothing less than God's miraculous working. And this, again, we have a thread going back to Sarah. She conceives a child. Not only this, but uh, there's another um, woman that we should be thinking of in this uh, who had a child who was dedicated to the Lord and was barren. I think we also have a look back to Hannah, um, who was the, the wife of Elkanah and the mother of Samuel. Samuel, who was a uh, priest, prophet, and judge. Let's not forget. And because um, of who... John's parents are, don't forget that he is both priest and prophet as well. So we have that. And then the final verse that my disgrace is removed, verse 25, disgrace removed. I hope that you see that that, I'm just going to go with a, I'll just go with a green line here. Um, although blameless, she had shame all the way at the beginning of this story. And the Lord has removed that for her. Just a wonderful thing. Uh, God's love towards the barren woman. Her disgrace is removed. And if we're looking actually at one more thread, there's one more barren woman that that connects to, and that is Rachel, the mother of Joseph. And that's why she names her son Joseph, is because God has removed her shame. So we have a story that echoes over and over and over again back to the uh, forefathers of Israel. It heralds to... Um, or sorry, it, uh, all those stories kind of heralded the way for God's faithfulness. Unfortunately, Zechariah doubted in the middle of that, but that's okay. God gave him a sign anyway. It just came in the form of discipline, and God made good on the promise. Elizabeth conceived the child. God is faithful. God is good. His goodness and his faithfulness are all over this story. Amen.